Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle and I'll be your webinar moderator today. Today's webinar is sponsored by Natroad's platinum partner, Bridgestone. Tires are your vehicle's only point of contact with the road. That area of contact is the size of your hand, meaning the lives of you and your loved ones are riding at great speed on just four handprints of tread. That's why it's important you choose a tire brand you can trust. Our speakers today are Georgia O'Keenan and David Mitchell. Georgia O'Keenan is an experienced strategi strategic urban policy professional with a career spanning more than 20 years in planning and transport policy and reform across all three levels of government in Australia. She is now applying her passion for strategic thinking and innovation to working across governments, industry and research communities as director of the Freight National Freight Data Hub. David, Mitch David Mitchell is Director, Transport Research and Modelling at the Bureau of Infrastructure and Transport Research Economics, which provides data and analysis with the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. He has responsibility for modelling and forecasting domestic passenger and freight movements in Australia, benchmarking infrastructure project procurements and leads the Bureau's efforts to investigate new sources and methods for measuring transport activity. Like always, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in, your, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll be answering the questions at the end of the session. So welcome everyone and over to you, Georgia and David. Thanks very much and thanks so much for having us today. Um, we're really thrilled to be presenting to Natroads and your membership, including people who might be watching this um, as a recording, so thank you. So I'm going to kick off um, just giving a bit of background about the Freight Data Hub, um, what it is and how it came to be, um, and then we'll dive into some of our more specific um, road or truck related programs projects. So the Freight Data Hub is a concept that um, came forward actually from our industry stakeholders as we were doing um, all of our consultation and workshops to develop the National Freight and Supply Chain Strategy over 2018, 2019. Um, one of the overwhelming theme, I guess, that we heard was there's something wrong with freight data. Freight data is not working. It's one of the main um, reasons for um, a drag on our productivity across the transport system. Um, so it came strong, came forward as a really strong theme. Um, but we needed to do a bit more work to understand what sort of role government should play um, in the space um, and how we could help. So over the course of the next couple of years, sort of 2019, 2020, 2021, um, we did a whole lot of extra work um, to really dive into the detail with both industry um, representatives and um, state and local government partners to understand what a freight data hub actually should do. Um, and uh, came up, I guess, with, with this kind of high level summary. Um, there's a lot of detail sitting behind this, but this is, I guess, the, the crux of it. So there were three key outcomes um, that people really wanted us to focus on. Um, they were around getting more and better data for strategic planning and prioritising our investments in transport networks. Um, improving the, the capture of data for day-to-day -day operations, not so much actually capturing and hosting day-to-day -day operational data from industry, um, but helping industry develop the data standards or sort of seed the systems that um, we need as a nation for industry to be able to exchange um, data more effectively across the supply chain. And then lastly, um, people really still wanted to improve how we evaluate how this freight system is performing and where we need to pinpoint our investments or our time and energy to improve it. So that's a lot about benchmarking um, across the states and territories or across Australia with other um, sort of global supply chains and um, comparing how we're going. Um, so we also um, were asked to narrow down on five key data priorities, which kind of 
uh, link with the main data gaps or problems that came forward. Um, they relate to vehicle data, which is mostly what we'll talk about today. So information about exactly what vehicles are on the roads or rail um, and even um, shipping in particular. We have quite good information about um, air, air vehicles. Um, and then where they're going, um, so that really, really detailed kind of big data about um, GPS locations or telematics. Um, then we're also asked to focus in on consignment data and tracking particular um, consignments or parts of freight across supply chains. Um, really careful look at containers and where they're going and what they're doing. Then, of course, the infrastructure that we have for freight across all modes is another big data priority. And then costs, um, both costs to the sector and, and sort of the cost of moving freight, but also the impact of regulation and how that flows on into those costs, which is something everyone wants to know, but is also a really tricky one to unpack, of course. Um, I won't spend much longer on this slide. There's the other key functions that people asked for from a freight data hub were around open data. So government really making more of the data it already has more accessible, more visible, more available um, for others to use, um, but not just that. So we are also being asked to facilitate more data exchange between industry or between government and industry, which is more in the space of data that needs to be kept secure, that might have some commercial or privacy sensitivities um, and would only be exchanged with kind of agreed parties or, or particular businesses. So that's also an area um, people wanted the Freight Data Hub to, to help boost across Australia. And then lastly, um, people really wanted it to provide some kind of leadership and innovation and kind of inspiration across the ecosystem um, to help people kind of uh, understand what we can achieve with more and better freight data and if we address some of these challenges. Um, and last but not least, um, we did kind of uh, have some really key enduring questions emerge from that consultation as well, um, which are down there at the bottom of the slide. I won't run through every single one of them. Um, or we, we won't finish on time, but they're there. So the first thing we did off the back of um, that research and sort of settling that high level design um, was to create a prototype website for a national freight data hub to demonstrate um, what we could do with the data that we have um, and also start to tease out what some of the problems with the data were in more detail. So there's three main parts to that website. Um, the first one is around insights and that's where you'll find all kinds of um, really quite incredible interactive maps or graphs, which I'll show some examples of in a minute. Um, we also then created the first um, freight data catalog um, where we pulled together a curated um, account of all the sort of most useful or relevant freight data that people can search and download and use for themselves. Um, and then we also started to pull together all the information about freight data standards across Australia um, and uh, embarked on 13 key projects, which is really our, our next piece of work after the prototype. Um, just let me know if there's any questions. I'm hope happy to pause. <laughs> Um, so moving right on then into the insights part of our prototype, um, we have around 10 up there at the moment. These were done quite quickly in 2019, as I said, to sort of demonstrate the value of data um, and really sort of make the case for why we would go ahead with actually building a freight data hub. Um, some of the key ones I'm going to show today are around uh, road sort of movements um, and using truck telematics or truck GPS data to then understand a bit more how and where traffic's moving on the roads and start to directly use that information from industry to then inform our investments across government. So we look at things like uh, what kind of congestion uh, are trucks themselves experiencing across cities? Um, you know, what are the highest travelled roads for trucks as opposed to passenger cars? 
um, where are road works and road closures happening across Australia um, and how can we kind of predict those or, or manage them um, into the future. And then a whole lot of information, as I said, around road infrastructure. So road condition, um, the, the road assets themselves, how wide they are, um, what sort of surface they have, which also is really important for informing our investments. Uh, last but not least, rest areas, of course, are also really important um, in our road transport, our road freight transport system. Um, so quickly, um, our 13 projects span all modes. Um, another really strong piece of feedback that we had was that the Freight Data Hub needed to be mode agnostic and looking to fill gaps uh, across the system, regardless of what mode they might um, be in and starting to, to develop a holistic picture, a holistic evidence base around the freight system and how it's working that's not um, specific to one mode. So not specific to rail or air or maritime or roads. Um, so the 13 projects, I'm going to quickly whip through so you can get a feel for the breadth of work um, and then we'll dive right into roads. Um, so we have the next generation of that prototype catalogue underway. Um, we have a whole big project around reporting against our progress on the National Freight and Supply Chain Strategy. Um, so there'll be a, an updated dashboard and some good data flowing into that reporting. Um, we have a very large project with sort of multiple parts around road freight data, um, which is focused mainly on the road infrastructure um, with a little bit of work around traffic counts as well. Um, we have a fantastic project which David leads, um, building off the back of a successful pilot, um, collecting truck GPS or truck telematics data. Um, we have a whole big project focused on customs data and increasing sharing of customs data um, from Border Force into our department and then out to other uh, agencies that need that data to support their kind of research and decision making. Um, another big project around improving how we can sort of understand movements of containers. Um, a, uh, they're all big, but another kind of really, really important project around rail freight data, um, which is working closely um, with rail operators, both above and below um, rail, um, to increase the data sharing in that space as well, um, which has been quite a bit of a gap for a number of years. Um, uh, another one around freight consignment data, which is about tracking um, tracking parcels or, or consignments through the supply chain. Um, a big one around data standards and systems there. Um, the location registry, which is um, really just kicking off now, um, which I'll talk a bit more about. It's a, a basically in a detailed and collaborative address book for all the freight locations across Australia um, so that we can easily share information um, across all the parties um, from retail through to logistics through to producers um, about pick up and drop off locations and really streamline that process. Um, improving our domestic sea freight databases um, international benchmarking with CSIRO, which is an amazing model they've built. Um, building on our freight forecasts, um, which are, are sort of one of the key Bitree publications, again, that David manages. Um, so every time you hear someone in the news say freight's forecast to grow by 35% by whatever year, that's, that's usually David's freight forecast that's being used. Um, and then last but definitely not least, an overarching project around freight data standards. So that was a whirlwind tour. Um, I said this one question there. Did we want to pause for that? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, the question is, will the Data Hub record all Australian truck rest stops and their standards? Ah, okay, great question. Um, we actually have, I hope we have a slide a bit further on about our work on rest stops. Um, so I might um, expand on that one in a minute. Um, but yes, we certainly have a project around it. Um, 
by standards, I am assuming the question is around sort of the quality and, and what sort of facilities are there and, and what condition they're in. Um, we get some of that information, but there's probably a bit of a way to go to improve that too. So I'll definitely talk about that a bit more in a moment. Um, so that rest stops data stream is actually under this road data project. Um, so the key focus of this project is actually more working with the states and territories because they manage the bulk of our roads um, and they hold all of the or most of the detailed information about the condition and the kind of inventory of roads. Um, the Commonwealth gives out a lot of funding to support new roads or sort of maintenance of roads. Um, and so we really want to kind of uh, even out that information and sort of get more, more information in a central area or centrally available um, to both Commonwealth and states around roads so that we can um, sort of co-plan and prioritise those investments. So the work we're doing specifically under this project um, is looking at three key streams of data um, that we want to collect from the states and territories, work with them to sort of harmonise it and improve the quality of it. Um, so, and then um, use that for our decision making at the Commonwealth level, but also release, re-release that as open data for other researchers to use. Um, so rest areas is one of those. So each of the states, uh, most of the states and territories do put out a database of formal rest areas um, as part of their open data stream. Um, so we've done a fair bit of work to connect to those, um, to pick them up and look carefully at them to harmonise them as best we can across the states and territories, and then re-release that as a harmonised national data set of rest areas. So that has actually just recently been released in our catalogue, um, and we have done some interesting maps looking at that, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, what we've learned from that process, and it's a similar one for roadworks, um, similar process for roadworks and then also traffic counts is that all of the states put out um, sort of the same but different types of data. So sometimes it's as simple as some have called um, uh, a road closure um, flooding due to flooding and they put the whole word flooding and some will call it FLDNG, flooding. And so we have to join and map those things. Where it gets more complicated is if um, some of them haven't um, included the reason at all for the road closure. Um, and so when we get to some of those more problematic issues with data, uh, we're just now at the point of going back out to the states and territories one by one um, and asking if they can add missing fields or slightly change their descriptions or provide a bit more information here and there to, to make that data even better. Um, rest areas is a great example of that. Um, some of them put out that updated data sort of every three or six months um, and some haven't been updated since 2017. Um, some of them put really, really detailed information about what sorts of facilities are at the rest area. Um, and some really only sort of have two descriptor fields, for example, say formal and informal. So we still have a bit of work um, going around the states and territories and enriching that data set. That's definitely our goal to have it be better and better over the months and years of the Freight Data Hub. Um, I'll show you, oh, I should have said, um, some of the key uses for this road data will be around national service level standards for roads. So a bit like for the national freight strategy, um, another team is working really hard to sort of agree with states and territories um, what sort, what um, different types or categories of roads um, should provide what levels of service across different um, aspects of the road, and then to develop some data pipelines to enable us to report and monitor on those things. So this is laying the groundwork for that kind of national reform. 
Um, and we're also working on a, a base map of the road network, which again, you um, would think is not too complicated, but turns out to be reasonably complicated. Each of the states and territories tend to break their roads into segments in different ways. And then when you have a really detailed geographic information system type map layer, sometimes those roads don't even perfectly join at the border. So it's a bit of work to do there. Um, I'll skip over these just in the interest of time, but happy to, um, to come back um, if we need. Um, so before I actually start showing uh, some of our inter interactive maps, I thought I would just um, focus in on one of the questions we had before the webinar, um, which was around traffic counts across the National Land Transport Network. So Bitree um, has done some fantastic work in the past to um, pick up some administrative data that the states and territories share with the department, with another area of the department. Um, on traffic counts and road roughness and things like that as part of a funding decision and examine that um, to just understand heavy vehicle counts and sort of lighter or passenger vehicle counts across the national network. Um, so this gives you a little um, snapshot of what that previous analysis looks like. Um, and that's a data um, set that we receive each year from the states and territories. Um, it's fairly high level. Um, the roads are usually split up into kind of one kilometre or even longer segments. And that data is sort of sent through manually in spreadsheets. Um, and then we publish this PDF analysis. Um, we haven't done this, we haven't published this particular publication for a while, um, but it has been quite popular and useful. Um, what we have been doing um, as, I guess, the next generation of this <clears throat> is in the prototype website, um, picking up some similar but a bit more detailed streams of data about the same information, uh, road roughness, traffic counts, um, and but these go right down to 100 metre segments. Um, and instead of putting them as a sort of a research publication, we've put them out as an interactive map, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so there's uh, a bit of progress there, um, but also we feel still a bit of work to do. So that data is still manually sourced from the states and territories. It's still really not um, as harmonized as we would like. Um, so for the next generation, uh, when, once we move out of our prototype phase, um, we are aiming to have that data flowing in automatically and then into the interactive map automatically um, updated. And then also releasing the, the raw data, if you will, in our catalog for other people to use uh, rather than just as tables in our report. Okay, so now the good stuff. Um, so here's some examples of how we do use all of that different types of data. Um, and we're starting to uh, make it more available for decision making at that national level about funding. Um, so here is, um, I guess, the next generation in some ways of that more research focused publication, where we've taken, I guess, the middle column of the previous slide, we've got um, the traffic counts of both heavy and total vehicles or light vehicles. Um, and it's not just for the National Land Transport Network, it's for all the state managed roads. Um, the little tables showing the comparison of traffic lights is embedded in the interactive map and adjusts, adjusts as you go in and out. Um, and you can zoom right down into sort of 100 metre segments to see what the count traffic counts look like. Um, right down to a really fine grained level. Um, one of the other data sets that we like that I mentioned we have coming in is around roadworks and road closures. This is another really interesting one that we're working with states and territories to harmonize. Um, 
this is quite a rich source of data that some of the states actually update even every 15 minutes, so almost kind of real time. Um, but they update it and then the previous data is gone. Um, so it's only the real time data available um, as an open data set. Um, so what we've been doing um, for the last year or so is um, setting up some automated data pipelines to record or save that data every time it's pop it's updated um, and building up a history of where road closures and roadworks have happened across Australia that we can then now present as a timeline. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but on the left here, you can actually select a month or a different range and um, you can, or you can move it along and see where roads have been closed and opened over time. Um, so this one is also really good um, for understanding where investments happening in roads, so where roadworks are happening and roads are being improved, but also where roads are being impacted, say by flooding or bushfire or smoke um, or even COVID um, border closures. So um, I'm not sure if we have the slide in here. Maybe we do. Here we are. Yes. Yeah. So this one shows that about the height of the pandemic, you can see quite a few um, road closures along the New South Wales Queensland border, for example. Um, and if you zoom in, it's a bit more visible along the uh, South Australian and Victorian border. Um, and in fact, even along the Murray there, along the New South Wales Victorian border, you can see all those road closures popping up. So you have a really good history of um, where things have been closed. Um, this is one of those data sets which um, we have sort of had been saving for quite a while um, and then were recently really pleased um, that the CSIRO put out a call for data that they could use to support a study into resilience um, off the back of the recent Queensland floods and to, um, to um, work across state and local and federal governments to understand what could be done better next time around um, if something like that happened. And the CSIRO were able to take this whole historic data set to understand where roads had been impacted by flooding in the past and add that to their modelling and their research. Um, so that was a piece of data they would not have had access to before, um, which we're really pleased to be able to, um, to send through and was used for excellent effect. I think the study's um, still going on and not quite finished, but yeah, really valuable. Uh, here's a quick one, um, just showing some of that road condition data. So this is, again, that same state managed roads data set. Um, this just shows the international roughness index um, for the, the measuring trucks that drive around, um, just testing the strength and the roughness of all the roads. Um, and again, you can zoom right into 100 metre segments um, and just get an incredible amount of detail um, in this data set and in this map. Um, I'll flick through a bit more quickly. Um, this one just shows how we can layer up some of these different data sets. So here we've layered up the road roughness, um, the key freight routes um, in the pale grey kind of fat lines, and then the um, planned inland rail route in the blue over the top. Uh, this one just demonstrates again how we can layer up different pieces of information to help with um, infrastructure planning and decision making. This shows the key freight routes as blue lines and then shows historic um, as Commonwealth investment um, across our infrastructure program. So you can start to understand where previous projects have been focused um, and how that relates to, to freight. Perhaps I'll just pause there and check. There's no other questions around some of those. Um, no other burning questions? Uh, no other questions is, um, no. Um, for you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right, so that's a bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the road data work happening under the freight hub. Um, I'm going to hand over to David now to talk a little bit more about um, vehicle data and some of the advances that we're, um, or he is working on there, which is not specifically a freight data hub project. I think this one is more broad. Uh, thanks, Georgia. 
Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. So this is just a bit of an update about um, a couple of new collections that the Bureau is undertaking, which are really replacements for um, old collections. So um, the ABS has dis uh, discontinued its collections of the survey of motor vehicle use and the motor vehicle census. Um, and both collections uh, were in existence uh, or undertaken by the ABS for over 50 years. And uh, together they were used to inform a wide range of road related policy and regulatory issues, including heavy vehicle charging, um, modelling national and state road vehicle movements to help inform infrastructure planning and investment, and also um, undertaking regulatory impact statements of um, new vehicle safety regulations or new vehicle emission standards. Uh, we're also aware there are a host of um, both public agencies and private firms um, that have relied on the motor vehicle census data to help inform their operations. <clears throat> so given the importance of the collection, uh, both to ourselves and to sort of a broader audience, uh, we, that's uh, BITRE, have been working with um, uh, NEBDIS, so that's the National Exchange of Vehicle and Driver Information Systems, um, to stand up a replacement motor vehicle census collection. Um, essentially, what we're aiming to do is uh, reproduce what the Bureau of Statistics used to put out um, uh, to the same level of detail. So that is sort of classified counts of um, vehicles by vehicle type, vehicle age, make and model, um, uh, and also heavy vehicle types and counts of total numbers of trailers by different trailer types. Um, our aim is we've been working on this um, essentially since the start of this year. And the aim is to release um, our initial set of estimates for 2022 by the middle of this year. So uh, which is very, very fast approaching uh, where um, probably a couple of weeks behind where we, where we would like to be. So um, it's likely that we'll be releasing our estimates in the middle of July this year. Uh, longer term, the plan is to, like the ABS used to do, uh, to produce annual estimates. Um, yeah, the snapshot is at, at the uh, end of January each year, and hopefully after getting through this first tranche, uh, which is involved sort of processing uh, 40 million vehicles for the first time, or 40, 40 million vehicle, 40 million vehicle records, of which about 25 million are current registrations, um, it will be uh, a little bit easier and quicker to process um, in future years. So that's all I was going to say about the Motor Vehicle Census. So I think I'm due to hand back to you, Georgia, for the next slides. Um, there was just another question, actually, David, this one's probably for you. Um, it's, uh, will the new BITRE series show EVs, both light and heavy? I, yes, that is actually a, an important feature. In fact, it's a bit of a feature of um, some of the work that we're asked to do is to um, uh, provide information about the number of EVs. So we are actually working to try and um, uh, better identify EVs. I think it's going to be uh, a bit of a work in progress uh, because um, so the registry data is, um, uh, how do I put this diplomatically? It's it's uh, it's not always uh, the cleanest, um, and uh, we're having to do a bit of bit of quite a bit of validation of those records. But but certainly the answer to the question is yes. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. And I think that's a theme. Um, which is, I guess, kind of the theme across all of these new data sets um, that where the data has been collected more for operational purposes. So whether it's motor registries or um, customs kind of tracking things at the border or um, vehicles kind of and their GPS kind of data, then using that data for more research and analysis or um, other purposes requires a lot of work it's impossible to underestimate how much work it is I think to 
to clean that data and to, to get it in a format that's kind of statistically useful. Um, definitely a common theme. Uh, oh, so, okay, I'm just going to give a quick overview of our location registry project, and then we'll um, talk a bit more about truck GPS data. So the location registry um, is actually um, a project that went from a pilot through to full production as part of the freight data hub. Um, it's essentially a very sophisticated um, freight industry focused address book. Um, which is sort of based on core data standards that GS1 have developed um, that solves um, one of the key problems that um, industry have come to um, us with, which is that um, they are sort of wasting a lot of time uh, waiting at different sites to collect things, showing up when things aren't open, um, trying to understand what facilities are available at a pickup drop off point, um, trying to understand exactly where the gate is across an address that might be several kilometres long, um, all sorts of kind of inefficiencies and complexities um, based on just understanding the situation at specific pickup or drop off locations. Um, and a huge amount of um, sort of replicated or duplicated um, resources by different businesses developing their own databases of different locations and trying to keep track of all the rules and um, sort of tips and tricks for each location. So this project um, basically builds on a really great database that had been developed for hospitals um, to enable sort of time sensitive freight deliveries to get exactly where they need to go quickly in hospitals, which again, sort of very hard to navigate. Um, you can't just put a single address on, on something like a organ um, organ delivery for a transplant or really sensitive um, medicine. So um, this builds on that database um, and expands that so it can be useful right across the freight logistics system. Um, the owners of the location um, register their location and then keep the information up to date um, once um, sort of in one place and then um, all of the people coming and going from that location sign up and can get all the details they need about opening hours and you know uh, yeah as it says here dimension limits load limits who to contact um, amenities all that sort of thing so this is just kicking off um, uh, there's I think an announcement shortly coming of some pretty big retail providers picking this up and using it across their suppliers so really exciting project um, and one to look out for um, and sign up for if you if it's relevant across NatRoads members as well. Um, Yes, a lot of partners there already. So yeah, really hoping we can support this one to, to get critical mass and, and introduce those efficiencies for our whole um, supply chains. Um, so truck movements, this is probably the, the most interesting one. I feel like we should have put this first. Uh, this one, um, it, David is also kind of leading, uh, I might do a quick intro and then David, you can jump in if you want to. Um, similar to the location registry, this one's building on a really incredibly successful pilot um, project that David ran, um, testing whether uh, we could collect truck movement data or telematics data um, directly from industry into the department and into Bitry um, purely for sort of research and investment planning and prioritisation purposes. So there's no links um, with regulation um, and compliance. That's a completely separate, separate system and separate organisation. Um, uh, and so we have some, yeah, fantastic pilot, um, which will show you some data from, um, and there's even more reports and things up on our page. Um, we're Toll and Australia Post and several other um, sort of forward-leaning companies have been sharing their data very successfully into the department for a good couple of years, I think now, um, David. Um, and 
it's already been incredibly useful to just demonstrate how we can use that data um, for planning and investment and, and really build that link directly between government and industry, um, helping industry kind of show where resources might be needed and helping that message get quickly to government as well. So um, don't know if you have anything to add there, David, before I... Uh, no, you've covered a lot of my key points, Georgia. I was just going to uh, might add a couple of things. So, I mean, the genesis of, well, you're right, we've been doing this for about three years um, mm -hmm. with a couple of large providers, so Toll and Aussie Post and a handful of smaller operators. Um, and the genesis of this work was uh, essentially traditionally um, information about road, uh, freight sort of movements and and um, operations uh, we've had to collect using large-scale sample surveys which are both expensive and also impose a significant burden on you know the respondents so that's the freight companies and or truck drivers whoever's filling out a essentially a survey form so you know the the uptake of uh, technology by road freight operators we recognize as potentially offering a, a way of um, collecting similar information more cheaply and um, in a less you know less intrusive manner for for the freight operators themselves um, so i don't know whether you wanted to yes. to keep talking about the next slides or whether you want me to talk about the uh, let's see <laughs> oh i can keep rolling and let's do the same i'll keep rolling and you can chip in how about that <laughs> if there's anything sure sure um so we i guess what we're now working to do um ideally is expand that pilot um so that the we do get more of a representative sample of data and and it can be used as david said um, to replace some of those more onerous surveys um and give us a much richer data set um as well as a more easily collected one um my, probably the only other thing I thought might be good to flag here is um, we have sort of set up some template agreements working with Toll and Australia Post. Um, so we have some quite quite nice, clear sort of data sharing agreements there. Um, and we have a, a what's called a protected level system in the department for data as well, which I think really helps with some of those concerns around commercial sensitivity or privacy, which can be associated with this data. Um, I wanted to show and some you probably hit on, yeah. on you yeah, Sorry, I was just going to reinforce a couple of the key points you made yeah. before that, you know, essentially that those agreements specify that we're only using the data in an aggregated manner and uh, they're not to be used for any sort of regulatory or compliance purpose. And, and so we, BITRE, have a natural advantage because we exist purely to provide advice and research and don't have a regulatory function. Mm. And uh, the other thing is the data, uh, the information we're seeking is pretty minimal. It's it's really just, um, you know, the telematics data reports a host of things, but we're all we're interested in is sort of a vehicle location, the timestamp of, of that position record and uh, some sort of unique identifier for the vehicle so that we can sort of say yes that that vehicle was here at that time and that and and you know further along the road at the next point in time and, and from that information we turn it into sort of um, trips and stops matched to the road network and maybe that's a good segue into some of the insights um, in the here next we go. slides yeah see so you've reminded me that's such an important point isn't it that the data anything that's used for a map or even a piece of analysis that goes outside the team is aggregated up so anywhere where there's only a small count say less than 10 or sometimes higher um, is removed from the data set so we're really only looking at those large numbers um, so this is an example of one way um, that we've used this data in the prototype website um, it's definitely worth checking out some of the other reports um, on the Bitry site as well, looking at port catchments and where trucks are moving around port catchments, um, as well as congestion across our cities. But this is quite a nice kind of interactive demo um, where you can actually look at a particular road or route, um, even entering an address. 
um, to and from and then understand how trucks are experiencing congestion or what sort of level of congestion trucks specifically are experiencing on that road. Um, so you can get some really detailed information in the dashboard on the left over time of day. So you can see um, the evening peak sort of from 4 to sort of 6 p.m. on the top graph. Um, and then also month by month, you can see some months um, the trucks tend to experience um, some higher levels or some longer trips than others, um, which is interesting here. Uh, and also day of the week we've put. So there's, this just gives a demo of the types of things we can do with this data. Um, we've used color coding across the map to highlight where there's the, the biggest divergence from a free flowing speed. Um, and we've also been sort of starting to investigate whether we can create an overarching kind of congestion metric or a congestion ranking um, for a city or a sub-region, um, which is something um, those industry partners are interested in um, perhaps using and, and layering over their invoicing, for example. Uh, there's others. Well, here's another example. This actually shows some of the rest area um, information that someone asked about earlier as well. Um, so this shows um, the database that we collected about rest areas and some of the facilities information um, on the left, as well as the locations. But then we've layered um, the truck, the points where trucks are stopping for more than 15 minutes over the top of that. Now, it's important um, to just note that this is just from our sample um, in our pilot. So this is not necessarily the most used rest stops, um, but if we had a bigger sample, it would certainly be you know, the most used rest stops um, and be a really reliable indicator. Um, again, for heavy vehicles, um, which, which spots they're using the most. Um, and can then obviously be cross-checked with um, facilities and, you know, the amount of space and things um, to make sure that they are up to scratch. This one's a good, um, a good example of how we could do better with a bigger sample and how it would be great if people want to reach out and um, share a little bit more with David. Uh, here's another one actually, um, just quickly uh, showing again where those rest area locations are. Um, and um, we did a bit of an experiment to, to put um, a bit more of a route planning layer over the top where you could say I want to drive for uh, five hours to seven hours at a time. And then it will highlight in green for you um, the spots the rest areas that are within that time frame that you could potentially plan to stop at. It's uh, another similar one. Uh, and this is another one um, which is also again just such a useful example where if we had a bigger sample size we could really start to base some investment planning on it um, where we've just taken a look at all of the trips that started in the, um, where are we? Isaac Regional Council, and then where they went to. So all the trucks leaving in this sample that have left that council area, and then showing us what um, council area they ended up in. So it starts to give a feel for local governments um, of their flows. Okay, that's all of our slides. Um, happy to pause for a few more questions. And sorry, I feel like we have um, potentially gone over a little. No, that's all good. Um, we don't actually have any other questions. Um, ah, easy. Oh, yeah, so, so thank you, George and David, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions that you think of afterwards, um, please send an email to info at natroad.com.au. Um, today's webinar will be uploaded to the Natroad website, so please share it with your colleagues. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.